begin. So, let's recap what we've learned so far and try to tie them all together. Okay, here we go. We're up to 14b. 14b, we're talking about the distribution in this binomial. But before we do that, let's recap chapter 13. And then we go to 14, and then we'll continue today. So, 13. Exercise 13a. What was 13a about? Can someone remind me? It's 13a and b. They pretty much go together. But what was 13a? Let's go with Jack. What was 13a? Good. Basic probability notation. So basic probability, things that you've learnt in year 7 all the way up until year 11. Yeah. So you got things like tree diagram. You got tree diagram, Carnot maps, so Carnot maps. You got your Venn diagrams. You got your set notations. So like union notation, sorry. Union, intersection, complements, sets, um, universal set, all of that was 13A. What was then 13B about? Can someone remind me things you learned in 13B? Yes, and Sarah. Yes, we had conditional probability. Conditional probability. So it's like dependent probability. And then from conditional, you learned an extra two things, or not learned, but revising year 11 stuff. So in year 11, this was the part that you had to try to understand from year 11 probability. Conditional leads to the understanding of another two things. Well, independent events and mutually exclusive. So you have independent events, knowing the difference between dependent and independent. So dependent events versus mutually exclusive. Okay, so you learned that was 13A, 13B. That's pretty much revision of everything you've done prior to your like oh prior to your 12 yeah then you began C which is when we finally introduced the idea of what year 12 content was and I showed you the branches now what was 13 C about let's go with on yep that's it I was just telling you the difference between discrete versus continuous I haven't shown you how to do continuous yet but we've learned how to do discrete. So you got your favorable outcomes out of your total number of outcomes. The reason why you can do that is because you can count the number of outcomes. So that's what we're used to. What well, we've done from 13A, 13B, they're all discrete at the moment. Okay? So I taught you what discrete was. I taught you three things in 13C that I wanted you to know. So understanding discrete, what were the other two things that I asked you to understand in that exercise? 13C, name me another two. Anyone remember? Yes, Jack? No, that's for 13D. So 13D had another three things I wanted you to know. So yes, you had your standard deviation. What else? You had your variance. Expected, which is the mean, right? So that was what I taught for 13D. What was 13C? 13C, we understood discrete random variables. I taught you another two things that you needed to know. Good. Probability has to add to one, and I used notations. So remember, set notations was part of it. So PR, remember when I mentioned capital X equals little x, and a lot of you had that confused face of set notation. Being able to read, and I said the hardest part of 13C, which is really the whole chapters of probability, was to define what x represents. That's, that's the theory. Yeah? If you can define what x is, and you know what the question's asking, then you can solve the problem. It's when you don't know how to define it, it becomes a problem. Yeah, and I gave you an example, a VCE question on that as well. Yeah? So you had set notations, you had discrete. One more thing, what was the other one? What else are you missing? What am I mentioned in this whole list here? There's just something I'm missing. How do you calculate the expected value? Use something. What is that thing called? Not the mean. So calculate the distribution. Probability distribution. Yeah? We learnt probability distribution, which is what I was trying to describe when you had x, you had your probability. It is now a sketch of x axis by the y axis, the probability. Okay? So, 
you have what discrete was, I told you that you had your data. Along with your data, you can distribute this data, which we call the probability distribution. Okay? And then to read the notation so that you can solve the problem. That was 13 A, B, C. Once you knew how to read the distribution, you knew how to read the notation, then you were able to calculate the mean expected value. I showed you the proof for the expected value formula. I showed you the proof of the reasoning for variance. Why variance led to standard deviation. Okay? Now all of that is all theoretical. Now you're gonna apply that theory to every chapter you're gonna learn for probability. Does that make sense so far? Does it feel sort of like it's a picture? Yeah? Now, let's recap. How do you find the expected value again? So e of x is equal to what again? What was e of x equal to? So the expected value, what was the formula? How do you find the mean again? It is the sum, yes, Jason, sum of? Not x times x? Good, probability of x, p of x. Okay, the sum of x multiplied to the probability. So remember the distribution, we found out that, and I showed you through the proof, when you're doing the average, it didn't matter the number of trials that you do because eventually a number of trials cancels out with the division of the number of numbers, right? All you found out was it's the values of 1, 2, 3, 4, the x value of the data multiplied to the probability of the data. Actually, if you sum all that together, that gave you the average. That's what I was proving, yeah? Next one, what was the variance? What's the theoretical formula? And I also gave you another formula for that one as well, the computational one. What was the theoretical one? So the whole reason behind variance. Yes, and Sarah. Yep, it is. Good. So it's the x minus the... What do you minus? So if you've got your data, what do you minus it from? The? Mean. The mean, because it's what I expect. So remember the, the story that I gave to you is what if I made a prediction for your answer based on the hours you study? So if I made a prediction you're going to get 70, but you got 75, okay, it's a difference of 5. How do you know? Because you took 75, take away my expected, what I expect you to get. You get that difference. The problem with that is when you subtract the difference, you could get 75 or you get 65. It's equally as bad. I've made a prediction 5 up, whether it's positive 5 or negative 5. Right? The problem with the negative is that if you sum all my error, there's a net error of zero. Because if I have positive 5 plus negative 5, that now tells me I've got error of zero. That's why after you subtract it, what do you have to do? So subtract the mean, which we call mu, square it. Okay? And then add them all together to find the average, which is why that's the theoretical formula there, which I'll do like that. That's your theoretical for variance. Take your data. Minus from what I expect you to get, but then remember that could have a negative value. But the negative distance, if you square it, it reduces that problem. It takes away the problem of having a negative, a net error. Okay, so if I do the mean of all that, it means find the average of all my errors. My prediction for Phoebe, my prediction for Jack, my prediction for Jason. We get all the errors and we add them all together and divide it by number of numbers. That gives me my overall error. Okay, and that's why it's called E, which is the average of my errors. Okay, but I, I squared the errors to avoid the negatives. Yeah? Then finally, standard deviation. How do you find standard deviation? Good. Because we squared, we exaggerated the number of errors I did. If it was 5 off on average, but then you square that, that's 25 off now. So that doesn't matter. That's not fair for me. Because if I said you're, you're going to get a 45 and I was 5 off, then you could either get a 50 or a 40. But now if we're 25 off, well then... That's just really bad, yeah? So, square rooting it will tell you the exact or standard error for it. And this is your expected value for the variance. Now, just to finish off of chapter 13, what was the last formula? I gave you a computational formula for variance. What was that one again? So one that's easier to calculate using your calculator. The one above is your theoretical one. Yes, there is an e of x all squared. Good. e of x squared minus e of x all squared. Now, e of x we know. That's the mean. So whatever the mean is, square it. 
if e of x squared just means square all the x's before you find the mean of that. Okay, that's all it means. That is your computation formula. That's summary of chapter 13. Cool? So if you can tick off in your head right now, if you're looking at each and everything that I'm saying here, you can tick off and go, yeah, I pretty much understand. That's chapter 13. Yeah. Okay. Take that chapter 13, mainly to this side here, and we're going to use that for chapter 14 today, 14b, expected value variance. I'm not going to, I will briefly, really lightly mention about the proof, but I just wanted you to see how the theory leads to the proof. Okay? Anyways, can I rub this one off now? Yes? No one's copying? Otherwise, watch the video. Here we go. What did we do? 14A then. So I gave you a whole theory. I talked about discrete. We talked about expected, variance, standard deviation. We had an understanding of what probability is. And what is 14 about? What's 14A again? Yes, we did. Last session, we were running up and down. Well, I ran up and down, thank you. Trying to find a room. Our room was taken away. We had a double session on a Thursday. Oh, was that a Friday? Friday. We had that room. No, Thursday. I had a double session. What was it called again? Binomial. Thank you. 14A was binomial. What was binomial distribution again? Well, we didn't do binomial distribution, but we looked at binomial. What's 14A about? Name some things you remember from 14A. It was what? Good, heads and tails. That was one key part of binomial, bi, two. Two options. So remember, you have to determine whether it was a Bernoulli sequence or not. There were three things to determine if it's Bernoulli sequence. We said two outcomes. What else? It has to be. Very good. It has to be independent. And finally, what else? How do you know? Because without these three, then you don't have a Bernoulli sequence. If you don't have a Bernoulli sequence, you can't use binomial here. It has to have this. And they will test you this in the exam. They'll have a multiple choice question. You have to know these three conditions. So yes, you have to have two outcomes. You either get it or you don't. They all have to be independent of one another. And yes, consist. Oh, well, that goes with independent. That's what independent means. That every probability is going to be the same. So chances of throwing heads today is like half. Next one's still half, next one's still half, still consistent. But something about what I've just done. So when I flip a coin, there's only two outcomes. They're all independent. And what else? No, that's independence. That's why it's the same all the time. Otherwise, if it's dependent, it would change. It's a very small idea. All trials are the same. So every time you flip a coin, you don't say that, oh, I flipped it too high, I flipped it too low. We're making an assumption that every flip is exactly the same. And not only that, every flip, whilst they're all the same, every probability is independent of another. Okay, so they almost feel the same. So independent events, but also on that, to assume that they're independent, you're going to assume that every trial is the same. That's why when you're rolling a dice, when we say rolled six times, you always assume that every roll has been equal, has been biased in any way, that I didn't go, I chucked this really hard and it did a very small roll. Because that does change the outcome. See, if I had a dice right now and I had a four on the top and I just went, flipped it across, I might get a six. So the way I roll it also affects the chances. But we're assuming that every roll is the same. We assume that every roll that I do, the chances of getting something is the same. So it's constant probabilities, so independent. And then finally, that every roll that I do, there's two outcomes. I either get what I want or I don't get what I want. Those are the three conditions that you need for it to be binomial. Does that make sense? Okay, so try to think of a coin or try to think of a dice to remind yourself the three conditions you need for it to work. Okay? Now that you do know it's a binomial, then I also gave you a formula. I showed you the proof for the formula as well, how, how it came about. Anyone remember? How to find the probability? Using 
Good. 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 Okay. That <laughs> <laughs> pretty much summarizes what he was trying to describe. <laughs> this is N. Uh, so the total number of trials you have. So how many trials did I do? I could flip the coin a hundred times. X is, well, this is what I'm saying. The important part is defining what X is. So if X is the number of times I get tails, then how many tails do I want out of my hundred trials? Okay, every time I flip it, how many tails do I want? So if I said I want exactly three tails, well, if there are three tails, then there are 97 heads. So if there are 97 heads, how many different ways can I have 97 H's and three tails? That's what N combination. So NCR, NX tells me. Number of different ways. P is the chances of getting what you want. In our case, it's the chances of getting tails. The chances of getting tails is half. How many tails do I want? I said three just now. The chances of getting not tails, well, it's one minus the chance of getting tails. That gives me the chance of not getting tails. Yeah? So that's H. H, how many H's? I said 97 because it was 100 trials, take away three of what I want. So that obviously gives me now 97 heads and three tails, all the combinations you can get. Times all together. This is your binomial formula to find out the chances in a quicker way. Because the, the long way, if you did chapter 13, is you would have to sit there and draw a tree diagram of 100 trials and then look at all your tree diagrams to say how many of those have three tails and 97 heads. That would have taken ages to do. This is a summarized version. That was 14A. How do we feel? Good. Quick. So a quick summary there, okay? Because today's session, I'm now going to talk about the distribution of a binomial problem. So now that you've got the binomial, you're going to have a probability, and we're going to see some things about the distribution when you sketch it. I'm going to give you some names, you're going to copy that down, and then I'll give you the formulas for expected and variance, okay? And then that only applies, these formulas only apply if it's binomial, otherwise it doesn't. And the problem, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because a lot of students in the exam, they will remember the formula for expected, because it's the easiest one to remember, and they will keep using that, but it doesn't make sense because the problem is not binomial. So you have to know what kind of problem you have, and then you apply the right formula for it. Okay? So here we go. Now that we know binomial, we've got the formula, that's how you calculate the probabilities for the formula we want. Distribution, so once you know it's a Bernoulli sequence, it follows these three trial, or three conditions. Every trial has a two outcomes, every trial is independent, and every trial is done the same. It's consistent. That's the assuming that's the same, okay? Then, that's the probability formula. In case you forgot how to find combinations, write that down, that's your combinations formula. N factorial, so when you write Nx, N bracket X, that's the same thing as saying n factorial over n minus x factorial x factorial times x factorial. Okay? That's your formula because they will require that in exam one. You are required to know, know those. Okay? You are required to know things like, uh, let's say, n0, n1, n, n. Okay? So if I said, if I had three items and I choose none, how many different ways can I choose? One, because you've got three items, if you don't want to choose them, you don't want to choose any, then there's only one way of doing that. Don't choose it. There's only one way. Yeah? If you had three items and you want to choose one, then how many items would you be able to choose? Three. Because there's three. I choose one, I choose this, all that. There's only three ways. So this is one, that's three, and then three choose three. One. If I had three items, I want to choose all three, how many different ways can I do it? I can only do it one way. Take a ball. All right? So it's the same thing, if I use n, n naught would then be 1, n1 is n items, and n, n is also 1. So in exam 1, you'll find that they, they will require you to do that. So 1, you'll know it's binomial. 2, you have to be able to simplify something like that. Because <laughs> they will ask you to find n at the end of your exam. Because okay, that's usually when students find it difficult with combinations. Okay? Now, distribution. I'm going to show you on a CAS so you see what I'm doing. Okay, now they're saying construct and compare the graphs. Okay, if I know it's a binomial, so it means I have two outcomes, 
number of trials is, in this case, 20 trials. That means it's assuming all trials are the same, there are only two outcomes, and they're all independent. That's what it means when they are ready to use by having probability distribution. Okay, so as soon as you see that, you're assuming three, three conditions, and they're saying, let's compare the distribution when chances of what you want is 20%, chance of what you want is 50%, and chance of what you want is 80%. There's an A for each graph. Okay, so here we go. Let's do this on a calculator. Because if you were to do it by hand, it would have looked like this. You would have done probability of capital X equals X, and you would have said you get 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, depending on what X represents. You're doing 20 trials of this, doing all the way up to 20. To find out the probability, you would have said probability of X equals to 0 is equal to 20 trials, choose none, Chance of success is 0.2 to the power of 0. Chance of failure is 0.8 to the power of 20 minus 0. See, I'm just using the formula that you had. Now, if you were to do that for every one of them, it's going to take a while. So I'm going to show you on the calculator how you can do this faster. Okay? This is what we're going to do, and then we're going to distribute this so what it looks like so you know how to use your CAS to do it too. Okay? So grab out your CAS. I'm going to start fresh. Uh, let's do new document. Unsave. I'm going to start off with a list and spreadsheet. Take out your list and spreadsheet. Column A, I'm going to call it X. It's my data, my X data. So I don't know what I'm measuring. I could be measuring, you know, number of times I'm going to get a six, number of times I'm going to get tails. I don't know what X represents, right? But I do know I have 20 trials. So that means I can get either zero, zero of these ones I want, one of these ones I want, two of these ones I want, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, and I'm going to go all the way 20, okay? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, okay? So I got all my 20. What I want now is I want this side to be all the probabilities. So this should be P of X, okay? Oh, I should just do probability, so P of prob. So I need probability. Now what I don't want to do is to do what I just showed you before. If we do it all by hand, it's going to take a while to do for each one, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to generate for them to do it, calculate everything we want. So here, right in this box here, see where on the left is an equal signs. Here, I'm going to type in equals, okay? It will naturally come up as probability of this column. So prob is equal to, I want to tell it a formula. The formula we want is that we already know it's a binomial distribution. So go to menu, we go to data, Oh, not data, statistics, you got distributions, type of distribution we have, if you keep going all the way down, you got binomial, okay? Now notice there are two types of binomials here. There's binomial PDF and binomial CDF. PDF is probability, so that means when you're finding PR of X equals X. C stands for cumulative. You use cumulative when they ask you for like two or more. See, two or more would mean, it would say I had four trials. I said two or more, you would be finding probability of two, probability of three, probability of four. Is that true? And you add them all together. Right. Yeah? See, that was two, three, and four. These are PDFs. That's PDF, PDF, PDF. But instead of doing them all three individually, you can do CDF, which means two to four. You have a lower boundary to the upper boundary. Okay? In our case, they're not doing. CDF because we're trying to calculate for each row that I had. I had 0, I had 1, I had 2, I had 3, I had 4. So we want PDF, not CDF. Okay, so I'll show you that um, later as well. So let's do PDF for now. So PDF, number of trials. Okay, I had 20 trials. Probability of success. Now, according to what we were reading, A was 0.2. So 20%. 0.2. My X variable, well, if I go down here, my X is X. Is whatever x is, because I, I, I labeled the x column and I, I've also put 0, 1, 2, all the way to 20. So I'm telling it whatever x is, calculate the probability. For n trials is 20, chance of success is 0.2. So I press OK. It says binomial PDF, and I press Enter. They calculate the probability for me. Okay, for each one. Okay, so for each one, they've calculated the probability there. Yes. Say it again. 
What? Uh, I don't know. It was just naturally there. I don't think you need it. I just selected X. But I think if I were to type it, I just put X. I wouldn't put apostrophe. It's just probably because I did it through the menu. Just came up with an apostrophe. Did it work for you there? to picture it. Some, some of the questions in the exam will get you to sketch it. Some of the questions in your exercise books now will get you to sketch it as well, just so you get used to the idea. But I'm showing you how to do it on the CAS. So now that I've got the table, you can now go just to see what the distribution looks like. You can go to control, add a page. In my case here, I'm going to add data and statistics, the one number five. Okay, this one I will show what it looks like. I'll show the picture of what it looks like. So if I press five, these are all the data I've just entered, but it's scattered. It's not organized. So what I can say now on the x-axis, click here. I want it to be all the x variables. So I click x. Now then the x. And I want the y-axis to be the probability. So if I click that and do prob, you get the distribution. Instead of you drawing it yourself, the calculator does it for you. Now what I want you to see when you put all the probabilities together, this kind of makes sense. This kind of makes sense because remember, what was the chance of success before? 0 0.2. 0.2. You told me that we did 20 trials. So out of 20 trials, what's the chances of you getting what you want? 20%. So it makes sense that 20% 20 of 20, what's 20% 20 of 20? About 4. So between 4 and around here, that's where you should mostly get the data, which is what it's saying. 20% of the data should be about four. 20% of number of trials, so that's why I said number of trials doesn't matter. That's what we knew. To find the expected value, it is the percent times the, the number of trials. So like last time, I, when I first taught you, I asked you, what's the chance of getting head to tails? You said 50%. I said if I had 1,000 trials, I said, what's the chance of getting heads? What's the chance of getting tails? I asked what you expect, you said 500 to 500. That's the same thing here. I'm saying now, what if the chance of success was 20% and I've got 20 trials, what do you expect? You would have said around four. This is one of my expectations. Okay, so this is my expected value, this is my mean. And this is your distribution. Now you can see that most of your data will be at the 20%. But if I said the chances was 50%, okay, rather than 20%, what do you expect the graph to look like then? In the middle. And when you watch, if I go back to the page, if you do control arrow and you move back, and I change, double click here, and I change the probability instead of 0.2 to 0.5, and you go back, change the probability, and you look at it. It's true. It's more than normal distribution between 10. Okay, and they will give you this at the end of the exam where they give you graphs. No job. They might say, find P and find N. You can find n just by looking at the number of trials, where you can count the number of dots. That tells you how many trials you have, right? If you want to find probability, what's the chances of what's likely that? How on there? Whatever that value is, they have to give you the value on the y-axis. Then you know what the probability is, or the mean. You can expect what the mean is. That's what, I, that's what exercise 14b is about, analyzing your distribution. Cool? 
Okay, so now we give them names as well, so they do have names. This is your symmetrical distribution, okay? The one before, so when I had point two, you got three types of graph. Point two, now this is a bit counterintuitive. Whoops, what did I just do? Uh-oh. No! Messed it up. I did. Is that it? Woo! All right. Point two. I just realized that was getting recorded. So at some point you're going to watch it. It's like, no! <laughs> Anyways, here we go. So we got this distribution. We call this positively skewed. Positively skewed. Okay, it sounds odd because it feels like it's on the left hand side, so we normally call it negative. But it's actually because it's getting skewed and it's stretched in the positive direction. We call this a positively skewed graph. The other one was symmetrical. Now, if you had 80%, you would expect the data would be 80% of 20. Yeah. So then it would be negatively skewed. So now if I go back up here and I change that to 0.8. What's 0.8? And I go back here. This is now called a negatively skewed distribution. Okay, because the tail end is being stretched out in the negative direction. So we call this negatively skewed graph. The other one was symmetrically. So it's not even skewed, so this is the symmetrical, and then the other one was positively skewed. Okay, so it's a bit of a different counterintuitive, because normally people say this is more positive, and the one's more negative. It's actually the other way, because it's the word skewed. Skewed means stretched out. Yeah, so negatively skewed, positively skewed. How do we feel? Pretty easy? Okay, so point B, three things that I wanted you to understand. Symmetrical. Positively skewed, negatively skewed, what those mean. I wanted you to be able to do that on a CAS. So can you distribute on a CAS? Can you read from the CAS? Or can you read from the graph? The number of dots represent the number of trials. Because every dot represented a trial. And the chances of getting it. Okay? The highest point has to tell you the mean. The expected value. Or the mean. Okay? Yeah, the expected. Because the mean was like, when you said, yeah, 80% would be 80% of 20. Whatever that is. That's the highest, highest chance of getting it. Yeah. Okay? And that's how you read this. So in the exam, when you get these kind of graphs, don't be afraid of them, because actually they're the easiest ones to do. You just read what they have. Okay? Now, this also leads on to the next part. So I taught you there are three things that... Okay, those are the distributions. Types of distributions, we've got positively skewed, negatively skewed, and symmetrical distribution, which we've talked about. Now... These are the two formulas I want you to copy down. Okay, the next few slides, if you really can't be bothered, if you really want to tell me yourself, I talk about the proof. I talk about the proof how y becomes mp. And in a way, we did it intuitively before. You know how when I say, if the chance of throwing a heads and tails was 50%, and I said, out of a thousand trials, I said, how many of them would be heads and tails? You told me 500, 500. What you actually did there was you took my number of trials times by the chance of getting what you want. That's how you know what the expected value is. And that's what we did from the graph as well, from our distribution, we also did that intuitively as well. Okay, but mathematics is not about intuition, it's about logic. And so there is a proof as to how to get NP. So the next few slides, if you actually do download the PowerPoint, you look through it, it will look really difficult. What I've tried to describe, you have to do a bit of thinking and a little bit of background to, to get it, but you don't need to know it. I do need to know how to use it though. So 14B, this now allows you to find mean and variance. If you know variance, you know how to find standard deviation. But you have to know that this only applies if it's binomial. You can't use this if it's not binomial. And so that's why I'm saying in the exam, the reason why most students stick to NP is because it's the easiest one to remember. And so when you find expected value and you're doing the problems and it's discrete, a lot of students jump to binomial and go, yeah, NP. It's wrong. Okay, NP didn't work. We had to do the sum of x times probability. That was the theory. It depends on the problem. So you have to define what kind of problem do I have. If it is binomial, it fits the three conditions, it is a Bernoulli sequence, then you can use that. But if it isn't, you can't use it. Okay, so really distinguish what kind of problem you have. It's the hardest part of probability. Once you figure out what it is, it's easy to do. Okay? And remember, you are allowed notes. These formulas are on your formula sheet. And so therefore, you just need to know what kind of problem you have. If you know what problem it is, look at the formula sheet, bam. Expected value variance. It's all. Okay, so there's no 
memorization is just knowing the full kind of problem you're dealing with. Okay? So copy those down. M is the number of trials, P is the chance of success, N times P. Sometimes in your text we'll say Q. Q is the not getting what you want. Chance is not getting what you want. In our case, one minus P. Okay, so chance of not getting what you want, times the chance of getting what you want, times the number of trials will tell you the variance if it's binomial. Okay? But there you go. So for those who are in from here, you don't have to listen from here on. Now from here, if you want to know how it becomes NP, you're going to need to know what binomial theorem is, which I will teach that towards the end of this term. Uh, you, are, you can use x plus b to the power of 0 and x plus b to the power of 2. You learnt these formulas, x squared plus 2ab plus b squared. The, and these are coefficients 1, 3, 3, 1. All of these, the 1, 3, 3, 1 can actually be replicated by the combination. Using combination. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted uh, 3 over here, or cubics, row 3, 3 choose 1 becomes 3, 3 choose 2 also becomes 3, and 3 choose 3 is 1. And that's, that's nice because you can summarize this 8x plus b to the power of n into combinations to find the coefficients. So, in a nutshell, I'm saying this. If you had x plus b to the power of 6, instead of writing 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, you could write it as 6 north, so row 6, first term 0, row 6 choose 1, row 6 choose 2, all the way up to row 6 choose 6. That will tell you 1, 6, 15, 20, 15, 6, 1. Okay. From there, this is x to the power of 6, x to the power of 5, b to the power of 1, b to the power of 6. So b increases, whilst x decreases. Okay. And then from there, you can summarize this. And this is going to be key to where the proof comes from. Okay. x plus b to the power of n. k is what you wanted. Okay, so k is what you want. So if you had 3, or then it would be 3. Three becomes, sorry, three becomes three. Yeah, that's what they're saying there. B to the three, and then total minus what you want is what you don't want. X, that's how you get three, three. Right? If you can summarize it like that, then here we go. This is for those who want to know the proof. So, I told you the theory. This is where it's interesting. Binomial distribution, this is the formula for binomial distribution. Told me was n trials choose x probability what you want x times probably what you don't want total minus x. Now this is very similar to the one we just talked about. We just talked about a plus b to the power of m, where a the first term is a minus k. So this a actually represents that. B is here represents this, and k represents that. So the only thing is it's sort of switched. So here, that means I can rewrite the binomial distribution formula to a plus b to the power of n. That's what I can say. And that's, that's where it's sort of some of us will take a bit of time to think about that. But essentially, I'm trying to tell you is that's a plus b. Using this, I've changed. That's your a. That's a to the power of n minus x. That's your a, n minus k. Say thanks. Yeah, so if that's my a, so 1 minus b is my a, plus b, b is this term, b to the power of x, plus b. But the nice thing is, 1 minus b plus b is b's cancel out. 1 to the power of x is 1. So what oh. this means is that the sum of all the probabilities in the binomial distribution makes sense that it equals to 1. Okay, sum of all the probabilities should equal to 1. And that's going to be the key for the last step. So here we go. From here, now you can do it. No matter how do you find expected value? It was x times probability of x, right? Yeah. X times probability of x, because you know it's binomial. Now, for this, we already knew that we could write it as combinations. Okay, write it as combinations of that. The combinations, this is where it gets a bit tricky. Okay, so you've got your combinations now. We change it instead of x equals 0, this one is 0, 0 times everything is 0, so we start at 1. 
from here, I can take out at this place here, okay, they've just broken up x factorial, which is the same thing as saying x times x minus 1 times x minus 2 times x minus 3. So they've taken out x times x minus 1 factorial. The reason why they took out the x's is you can cancel out the x's here. Cancel out the x's. Okay, so we cancel out the x's here. These cancel out. Now you've got this line here, okay? So we cancel out all the x's. Now on the next part, whoops, here we go. So from here, I cancel out the x's. Next step is, this is where it gets really mathematical. From here to here, there's a lot of thinking, okay? How did I go from here to here? They've taken out a factor of np. n from here, np from here. What? Yeah. So if this is n, remember n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, and it goes on, right? Yeah. So we can say, if I were to take out a factor of n, I could take rewrite this top as n multiplied to n minus 1 factorial. Yeah. So I've got the factor of n, and I can take that out. So that's n. Yeah. P, now P of x. If I take out a factor of P, Okay, it means that p times p to the power of 1, p times p to the power of something has to equal to x. Now, the only way to get x is if this was x minus 1. True? Because if you times them, you add the powers together, so I can now take away the factor of p, which is why that becomes x minus 1. I take out p, yeah. I take out an n. Okay? Now, this when I take out the n on the numerator, it's still n minus 1 factorial. On the bottom, how did this become n minus 1, x minus 1? This is where it gets really, really tricky, and I'll show you. Here we go. I'm just going to rub this all off. This is where you have to think. You know the stuff I just talked about, the binomial theorem? This is where it applies. n factorial took out the n. Yeah, it threw out the n away. We still have n minus 1 factorial on the top. That's still x minus 1 factorial. This is still, now, this last part here, we're used to it being n minus x. True. Okay. But we also know that when you did your original formula, it was n factorial over n minus x factorial times x factorial. True? Yeah. If I want to replicate that, if this is n minus 1 factorial instead of n, then this one would be n minus 1 minus, what if the x was x minus 1 factorial? Wow. Then this is x minus 1. Because right now I've got x minus 1 here. True? If that's x minus 1, so I can replace this x with x minus 1. That means this is x minus 1. But if this is n minus 1, then this is n minus 1. That's why I have n minus 1 minus x minus 1. Factorial. Okay, so I'll highlight what we're trying to replace here. We're replacing we're replacing the x with x minus one. True? We're replacing the n with x minus one. So really this is your n factorial n minus x factorial. See what I'm doing there? And so this is nice because now you can say if x factorial is the same thing as x minus 1 factorial, this is your x and that's your x. Okay, and that's why you can say if this was n choose x, is how you find n choose x, then this is now n minus 1 choose x minus 1, which is what they've done here. That's why it's confusing. Okay, there's no intermediate step between that. Okay, that's is what I mean when I when I sit back and I try to take between half an hour and two hours to figure it out. That's what I'm doing. Okay. So now that I know that, to make things easier, they call it z z variable. So let x minus one equal z, and that's z here z. Okay. Anyways, from here, we already knew that the sum of all probabilities, because it's binomial, should be equal to one. So if all of this equals to one, one times n plus Okay. <laughs> but at the end of the day, like I said, you don't need to know this. Ah. 
it is more for you to see that you're using theories x times probability of x. Okay? So that's chapter 14b, exercise 14b, variance, expected value, and that's all you need to know. Okay? We shall continue tomorrow for 14b, and I'll tie it into the 14c, but that's all you need to know. Distribution, binomial, expected variance. Yep. Yeah.